Greetings once again to each and all, friends, students, and allies scattered across the planet, to my secret lovers and my warrior brothers, and anyone else who can stand to listen and stand with the truth when they hear it. This is the main Turton, John Lash, recording on the 16th of July, 2015. And I'm here to talk to you about the tragedy of the mother. I'll begin this talk by asking you a question. And I'm going to play with your NLP a little bit, as I so love to do, by putting the question in two forms, two versions. So here's the first version. Do you believe there is a God capable of creating this world who also inflicts punishment upon it? That's the first version of the question. Let that sink in a minute. Now here's the second version. Do you believe there is a God capable of creating this world who inflicts punishment on it? Or do you believe that there is not any God with the creative powers to create this world who would inflict punishment on it? Now, I'm quite certain that it's more than likely that you yourself have formulated these questions in your mind at some time in your life or through your life many times. And I have no doubt that you listening to me may have pondered these questions, these propositions of belief. Let's call them just provisionally speaking, okay? That you've pondered these questions at one time or another. I stated them as questions, but you can also state them as propositions of belief. For instance, you can say, yes, I do believe that the God capable of creating this world, that is to say, this planet with all that lives on it, and even what is beyond the planet, and even the entire cosmos, I do believe that the God invested with the power to manifest such a creation also inflicts punishment within that creation. That's stating it as a proposition of belief. And I could likewise state the second version as a proposition of belief. I believe that there is not any God capable of creating this world we inhabit from the earth itself out into the depths of the cosmos. There is not any God capable of creating the butterfly and the Himalayas and the still pond behind the old barn in Vermont. There is not any God capable of creating such a world as you behold who would also inflict punishment upon that world and upon the creatures in that world. And the operative syntax, the operative emphasis in that second proposition of belief is the word any. That is a word of unconditional qualification. So those are two beliefs, but they're not just beliefs. No, they're not just beliefs. No. They are propositions 
of NLP syntax that can be run through the human mind in the way that a string of data is run through a computer, to use an archonic analogy. And if you take those two propositions and you run them through any human mind, whether it be a Chinese-speaking animal, someone from Africa, someone from surviving from the Native American tribes, a modern Swede, a modern Argentinian, any human creature on this planet, starting with children of the age of eight, maybe younger, you can run those two propositions through the minds of all such people. If you do that, it is equivalent to conducting a test. I am testing you even by discussing it. This is a test. This is a test. And it would be so simple to make this test with anybody that you know. Ask anybody that you know. Use my syntax. Adopt the syntax. Hone it a little so that you're comfortable with it and so that it comes out of you as if the words were your own. And then see what is the response. But if you run this test like I'm running it on you, sort of, you must be clear that there are only two answers to this test. There's only a zero setting and a one setting. The answers are yes or no to those two propositions. For this test to work and to prove, to produce the results that are desired by the test, it must be run in such a way that there is no qualification. Oh, yes, but, and I could see this, but, and that might be that, but, and it's possible that God would be cruel and punitive in certain situations, but not in others, but no, no qualification. The answer that must come from the human animal subjected to this test is yes or no. And I can tell you what the results of this test are for everyone who takes it. If you believe the first proposition, which I initially introduced in the form of a question, then you select yourself into the creation of that deity who is both capable of producing everything material in this world and every creature that lives in it and is equally capable from its divine power to inflict punishment upon the world and those creatures in that world. If you believe that, then you select yourself into the creation of that deity. Period. Anyone, be it a Muslim, be it a Hindu, be it a Taoist, and they can't say, no, I don't believe in God, and it, it can't be a scientist. No, it's a proposition of belief in which the only value of the belief is to test your mind. It doesn't matter whether it's a belief or not. There's no way to get out of this test by making qualifications. The only honest response to this test is to answer yes or no. So bearing that in mind, let's proceed to the second proposition. Do you believe that there is any God with the power to manifest this world 
and all the creatures in it, from the earth to the outer cosmos, who would also be capable and disposed to inflict punishment upon the world, within the world, punishment upon the creatures of that world. Do you believe there is any such God? And if you answer, no, I do not believe that any divine being with the power to manifest the world that I behold in which I live is likewise capable of inflicting punishment upon me and the world entire. I do not believe any God can do that then you select yourself into the world of our Divine Mother and the Pleromic Aeons. And that is it. You want theology, you want to discuss divinity, you want to discuss the Holy Trinity, you want to do whatever your mind allows itself to do, in thinking about the divine and about God and God's goddesses, go right ahead. Spend your whole life thinking about it. Spend your whole life chattering about it. But no matter what you say about it and what you think, everything that is conceivable about divinity, world manifesting divinity, is tested by those two propositions. And the answer to those propositions is not just a passive yes or no. Yes, you believe in a divine power capable of creating this world who would also inflict punishment upon it. Yes, you do. Or no, you don't. Those answers are not passive answers. By those answers, you select yourself into two different worlds. Two different acts of creation, as it were. Those of you who listen to me, who care and dare to listen, and who follow what I teach, what I've been teaching over these last eight years particularly, will be well aware that I have used the metaphor of a divine experiment for the situation of humanity on this planet. So I'm kind of using a scientific analogy in a sense, but you don't have to be a scientist to perform an experiment. Children can perform experiments and often do. But this syntax of a divine experiment is extremely helpful, I find. It's exceptionally good because it allows me to teach many, many things. And it allows anyone with what remains of a sane mind to stand before the really great and difficult propositions of human existence and handle them without getting enmeshed in religion and theology and Baroque insane belief systems. With that syntax, you can just go out every day and look at the world at large, whether you're in the city or in the country, and say, hey, it's a domed laboratory. I'm in a divine experiment. Well, what is the purpose of this experiment? Who set up the experiment? And how would I, who is a subject within the experiment, know how the experiment is working out? Huh? How would I know? What are the terms of success for those who set up this experiment? And you know, for years I've been talking about this. I've been using such syntax as the designs and purposes of the Aeon Sophia. 
the designs and purposes of the Pleromic Aeons are encoded into this experiment that you're living, which you call your life in human society on the planet Earth. There is an inner configuration to the experiment. The source code, you might say. Now, as a telestic shaman, I can access that source code. I've done it many times. I can do it deliberately and repeatedly, and I challenge anyone else to do the same. That's a positive challenge. That's an invitation. I would like to see someone else do it, and I would like to see someone else produce some viable results, you know. So if you think you can do that, fine, do it, and then come out just like I do, and be totally honest and transparent, not only about the process, but about the takeaway, the product. It's a great part of the material that I have put on the internet over the last seven, eight years is the product of my investigation of how this divine experiment in the domed laboratory is configured, how it's configured. Now I'm going to say something that I haven't been able to say until this moment, or perhaps a moment in April, around April 6th this year, when I had the occasion to do a telestic session with an apprentice, whom I would call my star apprentice, and in that telestic session, I felt love in a different way than I had ever felt it in my life. And I felt love, I felt the power and presence of love within the cognitive ecstasy of Gnosis in a way that I never had before. You may know that I've said that the typical and uh, predictable feeling that one has in the presence of the organic light and in deep trance immersion with the earth is of overwhelming awe of the generosity of the planetary animal mother, of, of delight. There's, a, there's gratitude that brings you to, to sobbing tears, sobbing deep hysterical tears of gratitude, but that the factor of love per se is not, let's just say, not the prominent flavor of the experience. And I've said that many times. But due to the conditions of the earlier part of this year, and because of the way that love manifested itself in my life personally, it was able to reveal itself in my transpersonal investigations in another way as well. And I was not alone. So I was the witness to this love in party with a second human animal. And from this love, I'll talk to you now and I'll tell you something about how this divine experiment is set up. All of the pleuromic aeons who create experiments that come to be, that come to emerge in planetary systems in the galactic arms, all of them have the capacity to project themselves down into the most minute details of the processes of consciousness of those creatures who are the subjects of those emergent experiments in planetary laboratories. Let me say it again, more in a, in a briefer way. The pleuromic aeons know how your mind works when you are making breakfast. They know how your mind works when you're deciding 
to go on a journey or sitting down to draw a bird that you see in a tree. They know how your mind works because one thing, they are in your mind and because they designed your mind to work in the way that it does. So how can they not know how your mind works? Remember, there are three principles of Mayavada Vedanta, and one of those principles, the second one, goes like this. There is no gradient of awareness. I've said that before. Do you remember that? You know, I'm a teacher who doesn't like to repeat himself, or prefers not to repeat himself. I'm a teacher, if I do say so myself, that has produced in this decade of my life that's now concluding more original material than all of the spiritual teachers of the whole 20th century. That's because of the non plus ultra. The non plus ultra although it's a bit of a dis digression to mention it, but it's come up, so I'll tell you, I'll clue you, that the non plus ultra is the faculty that a human animal can have, such as myself, that is the closest to the pure originating awareness of the pleuromic eons, who themselves get it from the originator. So the originator, who is the one supreme divinity at the origin of the generators or aeons, is called the originator <laughs> because it originates. Well, I originate too, don't I? I originate from the non plus ultra. I'm not going to tell you what the non plus ultra is right now, but I'm using it as an example and using myself as, as the proof of a most extravagant statement that I'm making. There is no gradient of consciousness. There is no gradient of awareness, excuse me. There are frames of consciousness, but there is no gradient of awareness. That means that the attention you put into choosing between whole wheat bread and rye bread in the morning and the attention you take to put that slice of bread in the toaster and turn it up just the way you like it and the attention you put into having the butter ready to spread on that toast is the same attention with which the pleuromic aeons observe you making toast. Now, bearing that proposition in mind, the second proposition of Mayavada Vedanta, just consider what I said a moment ago. The pleuromic aeons know how you think. They know how you're going to think. When Sophia and Thelate designed the human genome in the pleroma, with the anticipation that it would be seeded in the galactic limbs as experiments routinely proceed and would arise emergently in planetary laboratories. They already knew how its mind would work. And so, this is a very far reach now, and you have to be very calm. You have to be calm as you can be in your mind. As close to silent knowing as you can get. And be poised. In order to receive what I'm saying. Since they already knew 
how your mind working right now was going to work. They configured the experiment based on how your mind is going to work when it begins to realize that it's in an experiment. And there was another factor. How wonderful is that? There was even another factor because these divine designers of creatures and worlds have a lot of fun doing what they do. And they love precision and complexity as I do myself. And they also love simplicity. Years ago in Santa Fe, I coined the term simplific. It's simplific, not simplistic, which is a kind of derogatory term. Oh, that's too simplistic. Oh, Johnny's going to say something now that's simplistic. It's too simplistic. It can't be that way. No, 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 no. I'm going to say something that is consummately simplific. They configured a prompt into your mind. A prompt. They put this prompt in your mind, and my mind, knowing that many human animals in this experiment on Earth and in the other planetary laboratories would not perhaps get to the point of seeing that they were in a divine experiment. And so they configured a prompt into the mind that would prompt the human mind to a questioning process, better said, to a wondering process. The prompt is a wondering process in your mind, a wonder circuit installed in your mind. They inserted that prompt in your intelligence so that it would bring you to the point where you could begin to conceive that you are in a divine experiment in a domed laboratory. And of course, that's where you are, many of you who listen to me. That's where you live now. The role of the Nahual is to provide syntax. The navigator provides navigational syntax, operational code. I teach people how to use their own intelligence in the best conceivable manner. And my privilege in doing that also gives me the privilege to tell you what I'm telling you now and to describe exactly what I'm talking about. Our divine parents Sophia and Thelete designed into your mind as it works today into your ordinary mind a source prompt. Call it the wonder circuit. I like that. Oh gee, I'm out walking in the field. I'm walking in the park. Or I'm sailing a boat. I'm rowing a boat. And I'm looking at the sky, looking down at the water, I see some fishes down there. I wonder, I wonder how, hmm, I wonder what, I wonder how this got to be, hmm. I wonder what was here, how it was not here, I wonder, you know. And this wonder circuit is like a little prompting device in your mind, in all of our minds. They put that in there so that you would eventually be prompted to use your intelligence in such a way that you can get to the point of conceiving of this experience 
of life on earth as an experiment. They purposefully, purposefully, and purposefully configured the source prompt into your mind. Now the source prompt has two prongs. Imagine it like a little tuning fork with two prongs. And you can imagine that the, the tuning fork is prodding you, prodding your mind. But you can also imagine that the two tines of the fork are resonating together. When this source prompt operates in your mind, or it's always operating, but by the way it operates in your mind, it generates, it tends to generate in your mental syntax two dispositions of questioning. This has all been designed from the Polaromic core. You think this way because you were designed to think this way. The aeons do not put any creature of our exceptional capacities, which is genius level, into an experiment without endowing it with the ability to know that it's in an experiment. But how do you come to that knowledge? Everyone can come to it in the same way that I came to it. We all come to it in the same way. We all come to it by the operation of the source prompt in our minds. I'm not going to be saying we anymore, by the way. So it's probably the last time you're going to hear me say we. You and I come to it. We come to certain questions by the operation of the source prompt, which is configured into your mind, the way your mind works, for the specific purpose or aim, telos, to do just that. So what is the evidence or detectable operation of the two aspects of the source prompt? Well, one of them we looked at at the beginning of this uh, this little talk. Every human being, whether they know it or not, and regardless of the degree to which they can articulate it in their minds, is prompted to ask those two questions. How momentous is what I'm saying? How, how momentous do you, how momentous is this? You tell me. Everything that the aeons give is freedom. Love and freedom go together. As Janis Joplin said, don't give me nothing, baby, if it ain't free. And baby, I don't give you nothing if it ain't free. But can you grasp what freedom is? The freedom that comes from the aeonic generators is divine freedom. They configure your intelligence to work in such a way that you discover and learn what that freedom is and you make it, you make it, you make it your own. That's how the experiment works. That's how the experiment is working right now as I speak. So, along one of its prongs, the prompt code engenders wondering and questioning that formulates itself into the question in the general structure. How can any God capable of creating you and the world that you are in and this planet and this cosmos also be capable of inflicting cruelty upon it? Notice I don't say putting evil into the cosmos. No, 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 no. Leave the evil word, leave the E word aside for a moment. Just say, a God who would be vindictive, cruel, and punishing. Cruelty is a subject close to my heart these days. And I would like to be able to get around 
to some remarks on cruelty toward the end of this talk. Now, what about the other prong of the source prompt? Well, it is a source prompt. If you want to conduct the operations of your own mind in an optimal manner which is simplific and produces reliable results, then you need to think of the word source or origin in two modalities at once. Here you are, alive and breathing, a human animal on the planet Earth. You're hearing my words. Here I am in my room with Nikki on the daybed. It's about 9.30 in the morning. Beautiful summer day in Spain. And what is source to me? What is origin to me? And you, wherever you are. It's two things at once. It's the source that you can't see, the remote source, and it's the local source. What is the remote source? The remote source is the origin of the earth, the origin of of the human species, the origin of the solar system, the origin of the galaxy we're in, the origin of all galaxies. The remote source is the originator. That is the remote source. It's remote in the sense that you can't immediately, palpably, and sensorially touch it. You're not, presumably, apparently, not in contact directly with the remote source. Now, Mayavada Vedanta would teach you some interesting ways to look at that proposition. According to the teachings of the Mayavada system of Hindu metaphysics, the infinite source, the infinite and boundless source of all creation, which may be called the absolute or the originator, is right here. It's here in this room just as much as my cat is here. But it veils itself by a mysterious power called Maya so that it can be continually rediscovered. This is a principle of Hindu Tantra Vidya. So, but let's just leave that lovely finesse to the side for a moment. That's a side order when we'll go over and stick our faces in that at some other moment. We, you and I will go over at another moment when we're feeling like we want a delicious treat and you and I will stick our faces in that Mayavada dessert. But for right now, we'll just say that the remote source can provisionally be understood as inaccessible, not sensorially present. Okay, what about the local source? Well, what is the local source of your life? What is the local source of all the people around you, the animals in your house, the inhabitants of Tokyo, of Rio de Janeiro, all the bears in the woods, all the termites, all the ants, the butterflies, the monarch butterflies, all the poisonous toads in the Amazon. What is the local source of all of those creatures? It's the planet. The planet, the planetary body, which is the Aeon Sophia in material imminence, so the Gnostics teach, the planetary body is the source of your life. It's the source of all the chemicals in your body, the water in your body, the salt, the saliva in your mouth, the iron in your blood. It's the source of all of those things. They all come out of the body of the planet to form you. So any time that you like, at any moment that you like, you as a human individual have the freedom and the opportunity to stand right before the local source of your existence. Just like you might stand before a cow or another human being or the, you might stand before a beautiful statue or a work of art. Now what happens 
when the source prompt prompts you to go to the source, the local source. You see, the first aspect of the source prompt does not concern the local source. It concerns the ultimate origin of any, everything. So we put that word, we. It has been the custom of human animals to put that word, God, on the ultimate source. That's the remote source. And so the source prompt generates one line of wondering in respect to the remote source. And it generates another line of wondering in remote to, in regard to the local source. And that is the problematical issue. That second prompting toward the local source is the deeply problematical issue for the human species. And it's a deeply problematical issue for the mother herself. While the Nahual would formulate, would propose to you, would invite you to consider the proposition for the first aspect of the source prompt in terms of belief, we'll call it proposition of belief, go Review those two propositions of belief can really be reduced to one. Review that proposition of belief. Do it. Discuss it. Verbalize it. Get comfortable with it. Spin it around. Look at it from different directions. Test your mind with that proposition of belief. By contrast, I would call the other factor in the operation of the source prompt a proposition of recognition. Now you could go and do a survey in the streets of New York or out in the farm fields of Iowa or any place you want to go. And you could go up to another human animal and you could say, do you or do you not recognize that the source of your very life and of all that lives, all that you know of the living is right there under your feet and all around you in the panorama of nature? That's a question you could ask anybody. You ask an eight-year-old child that, an 80-year-old Chinese sage, anybody. And once again, this question is a test. And there are only two answers to this question, either yes or no. Now, what I discovered about the human species since I wrote not in his image has been many things. And there are certain recurrent lessons that come to me as the individual, the sole and singular individual on this planet who has disclosed the nature and behavior of the organic light to the public. As such, as the agent of that information, certain questions recur to me. And one of those questions concerns not just the ability of human animals to recognize that the planet Earth is the local source of life, but the willingness, the willingness the desire to recognize it. And I have to report to you the brutal and 
tragic news that there are human animals wandering around who have no inclination whatsoever to recognize that. And that is the tragedy of the mother lived out in the lives and minds of our children. It's a tragedy of recognition or of non-recognition. Same definition in two different forms. Now, here I stand at the 45 minute mark. So let's say 15 or 20 minutes to go. Who knows? This is a delicate juncture. Oh, yes, it is. And what would I like to say to you at this point? What am I compelled to say? Lately, I am under some very intense compulsions of self-expression, which accounts for the lapse that you've seen in my, in my recordings. I'm compelled to remind you that the inner module of planetary tantra is called Kala Tantra. I have taught a lot about planetary tantra and I haven't even begun to teach. I could talk if people were here 10 hours a day for the rest of my life, except of course when I collapse or fall face down into my dessert, uh, I could talk for the rest of my life and just begin to expound the wonders of planetary Tantra. But I ask you, If you might take a moment to consider that I also carry the teachings and instructions of Kala Tantra, which I have hardly yet expounded. Now, there are three Diamond Sky Dakini instructions in Kala Tantra. What are they? One, the addiction becomes mastery. Two, disposition is the mother of intent. And three, desire is the measure of all compassion. Now, I refer to Kala Tantra at this juncture in order to get a, call, get a couple of things across to you. First place, take note that the second instruction of Kala Tantra is a tremendous tool of discernment and discrimination. Disposition is the mother of intent. When you practice in the Kalika way, which is the inner dark heart of planetary Tantra with its magical, erotic, and sexual secrets and techniques, you find yourself on a path of excruciating intimacy. You become excruciatingly intimate with how the human animal operates on the emotive level, not on the intellectual level, but on the emotive level, on the visceral level. You have to hone your animal instincts to be a Kalika. And one thing that you practice is the act of discernment so that you'll know whether or not you're wasting your time with people. For instance, I may have a friend that I would like to go rowing with because I like to get a rowboat and row around Friendship Harbor and out to the islands and dive off and eat 
cold, salty water and fine sand dollars. So I might have a friend that I'd like to do that with. And I tell them and I persuade them and I invite them. And I spend a lot of try time trying to get them to go rowing with me. But they just don't go. Why not? Because they don't have the disposition. And disposition is the mother of intent. So if I practice the Kalika instruction, the second instruction, then I would observe that they don't have the disposition. And I wouldn't spend five seconds of my precious time trying to get them to go rowing with me, you see? And you can apply this, obviously, to hundreds and hundreds of different situations. Well, let's apply it right now to this question of recognition that the local source of life is the planet. The fact is, many human animals today have no disposition to make that recognition. None. And since they have no disposition, they can't follow the second function of the source prompt, and they will never arrive at the intent to see and understand and embrace the very source of life that it's in front of them and all around them. And those people are a write-off. The sorrow is not about those people not recognizing the mother. No. The sorrow of the mother is about the failure in the human animal of that disposition. You see, there's a difference. That disposition is failing in the human species. The disposition to recognize that the earth is divine, that it's the source of all life. That disposition is failing. And so she, our divine planetary mother, doesn't get that recognition. So with that said, I come to another aspect of Kala Tantra that throws some light on the tragedy of the mother. You know, I've said some original things. <laughs> and glory be, I continue to say them. And I would also note with great delight and great pride that some of you in Planetary Tantra are starting to get pretty damn original yourselves, aren't you? You're starting to say things in, in Celestics that are original. You are not teaching what you know. You're not waiting years to learn something and get a diploma. You're teaching what you're learning and what you bring forth in your expressions and observations and insights is original and getting more and more original by the minute. One of the things that I've said that probably stands in the top five of originality is that addiction is the source of the manifestation of all the worlds. The earth wouldn't even be here. No planet would be here. No spiral pinwheel galaxy would be here if it weren't for addiction. This is what I realized in the Rhonda moment. And the anniversary of that moment is coming up in five days. July 21st. I realized at the Rhonda moment it was a cognitive illumination. That is to say a mystical, transcendent illumination of super intense emotion informed with some cognitive con uh, content. I realized that the universe fuels itself 
by hungering after its own beauty. It wants to consume its own beauty and it wants to be consumed by that beauty in turn. That is the original syntax that comes from the Rhonda moment. The gods are addicted to gambling. To them, these experiments in planetary laboratories are like card games they play. Baccarat or roulette, poker, blackjack. They're like games in a casino. They're gambling. And the stakes for the games are very interesting. What are the stakes that the aeons put up? when they gamble on an experiment. Are there a number of aeons in the pleuromic core of our galaxy gambling on the outcome of the experiment of Anthropos 10 right now? You bet your sweet booty they are. That's what makes it interesting. What would make anything interesting to an omniscient, omnipresent, divine being if there were not a factor of chance and an open outcome. They are omniscient in the sense that they can see everything. They are not omniscient in the sense that they can see outcomes or control outcomes. They don't want to control outcomes. So the gods are addicted. And their addictions drive what you may call the manifestation of the myriad worlds. Now there's another lovely little snippet of Calica syntax that comes from that same day and that same moment when I went up on the ridge and I did tongue on knife. And in the five hours when I was handled by my guardian, Kali, I had the thrill of being shown that the root of all addiction is addiction to the pain of not being seen. Have you heard me say that before? Maybe you've heard me say that for the first time. Does it give you a little bit of a shiver? Well, I would like it if it did. The root of all addiction is addiction to the pain of not being seen. Now contemplate that proposition for a moment and then bring your mind around again to the topic of the tragedy of the mother and the non-recognition that she is the mother, that she is the local source. The planetary animal mother is not seen. No, she is seen. I see her, you see her. Let me revise the syntax. In those cases, when the planetary animal mother, the aeons of fire, is not seen, when human animals do not bring to her the recognition that she is there, then she also suffers addiction to the pain of not being seen. Even the gods, the highest gods, even the oldest, most accomplished pleuromic aeons, and there are differences in age and, and accomplishment of the aeons. Sophia is a young aeon. Even they are addicted to the pain of not being seen. Even the originator <laughs> is addicted to the pain of not being seen. But you must understand, my friends, that when you can experience addiction in this way, it's the ultimate mystical metaphor. When you can experience it or comprehend it, at the transcendent level I'm indicating,
then you know that the intensity of that addiction is nothing but intensity. And that the intensity of pain and the intensity of joy are just intensities. So although the aeons of fire is addicted to the pain of not being seen, which gives her sorrow, then try to comprehend how that sorrow feels to her. It's merely an intensity. You can't judge it as being good or bad. Now, when the aeons of fire is recognized, what happens then? <laughs> what happens then when the aeons of fire is recognized? Well, is she also addicted to the positive feeling she has, the joy, the delight that she has in being recognized? Nope. You know, it's an odd thing. Joy and bliss are not addictive. Isn't that amazing? They have the same intensity of an addiction, but they're not addictive. That's one of the reasons why they appear to be so elusive. You know, if you study the foundations of modern psychology, this is just a short footnote, you'll find that modern psychology was based on the observation of hysterical women. And it was based on trauma and suffering and still is today. How much do you hear about trauma imprinted mind control, trauma, suffering, reliving trauma, Trauma and pain and sorrow and grief and all those emotions that we judge, and rightly so, as a human animal, as being painful rather than pleasurable, they stick. But pleasure doesn't stick like that, does it? What pleasure does is it invites you to more pleasure. You know when you're having really good sex when you can't get enough of it. And the better it is, the more you want. There's no satisfaction of pleasure. Pleasure is not addictive. But pain, which is all rooted in the pain of not being seen, is a particular addiction operating as a cosmic force in the universe and as an emotional force in the human animal. So the mother right now suffers sorrow and pain from not being seen. There are two ways to see the Aeon Sophia in her immediate and imminent presence. Two kinds of recognition of her toward which every human animal is prompted by the source prompt if they do not resist it or if they have the disposition to follow the source prompt you and I and every human animal is directed to recognize her in two ways the first is the ordinary way you could say that planetary tantra, if anyone ever asks you what it is, you could say, oh, it's this rather interesting uh, set of teachings that uh, John Lash came up with that is all based on one simple and undeniable fact which most people overlook. What is that fact? You're living on a planet. You are on a planet. Most people disregard that. Who cares? It's just fucking scenery, right? It's just the planet is just a stage setting to most people. You see? It's a stage backdrop. It may as well be in one of those big uh, movie stage huts on the lot in Culver City in L.A. The whole world may as well be in one of those 
studio lots. Just a setting. Oh, it's a planet? Who cares? What difference does it make? The recognition that you are on a planet and that all of nature and all that lives in the natural habitat, including yourself, has the opportunity to be in the immediate presence of its source, that is ordinary recognition of the Aeon Sophia, our Divine Mother. Ordinary, that's just ordinary. Indigenous peoples around the world in their prime, which is long gone, and the pagan people of pre-Christian Europe, the Native Americans, the Native Indians, North and South America, all knew that we were living on a body of a living animal. No matter how they may have conceived the planet, not exactly as we do today, but they knew it. So they recognized the Divine Mother in the ordinary way. Next is the non-ordinary recognition. Now you know what that is, don't you? The non-ordinary recognition is what you have when you go into a telestic trance induced by the ingestion of psychoactive plants and you behold the organic light. The organic light is the naked aeonic radiance of the Aeon Sophia. When you recognize her, you recognize, uh, in the non-ordinary way, you recognize that the earth is radiant. Stars are radiant. The sun and moon are radiant. Don't you think the earth is radiant, is a radiant body? The earth is a radiant body. That is non-ordinary recognition, which is not theoretical and speculative. You know it when you see it. You know it when you're in front of it. Now, when human animals grant ordinary recognition to the Aeon Sophia, it produces a certain ambiance in the world. An ambiance that I would describe as erotic, aesthetic, hedonic, not hedonistic, that's an insulting word, but hedonic, pleasure-oriented. The natural effect coming from the planetary animal mother back to those who recognize her in the ordinary sense is to fill them with the love of natural things and to fill them with the desire for pleasure, the pleasure of your own body, the pleasure of kissing, exchanging saliva, pleasure of touch, the pleasure of the sexual encounter, the pleasure of walking in nature, feeling the wind on your skin, all the countless sensual pleasures of the natural world come back as a thrill of delight from her when you recognize her in the ordinary way. And when you recognize her in the non-ordinary way, she gives you amber. The organic light around you flushes with an amber that has in it the use of a pinkish gold marble. And I have seen that effect, not on my own, but co-witnessing it with another individual, someone I may call the Star Apprentice, who was my precious companion at that time, walking into a house with white walls, a stone house with white walls in the mountains of Spain, and seeing the ceiling and walls of the house as if they were made of tallow, of yellow, soft yellow wax. So saturated was that place with the joy of the mother. 
at her non-ordinary recognition by a pair of her magical children. So I invite you to that moment, and I describe that moment to you. And I trust that those of you who love the earth the way I do, and who love me the way I love myself, <laughs> and who know how much I love you in this adventure together, won't be envious. But you will know that it's there for, for all of us. It's there for all of us, and that is how it is. Those in the mysteries had the privilege of that amber gain effect in the non-ordinary recognition. And, and all of you today in Planetary Tantra are rebuilding and recreating the ordinary recognition to the degree that you can, to the degree that you can get into nature. You'll all have to f take refuge in nature eventually and sooner better than later. And so in that huge perspective, I would say, how would I close? Because I don't want to go over a minute, an hour and 15 minutes. What's the moral here? What's the takeaway regarding the tragedy of the mother? It is certainly a tragedy of the mother that the mysteries were destroyed. Well, they've been recovered but it's still a tragedy as long as the mysteries don't reach the world. This is the first time the mysteries have ever been brought to the open world, have ever been shared openly. And having done that, I must say that I've reached the point of an enormous presumption. Well, uh, if it's come to the moment at the dawn of the 21st century when the mysteries are restored and presented to the world at large as never before, then there has to be some way of getting it to the world at large. And that's why I can't talk anymore to a handful of a few hundred people as much as I value your attention. The other thing I would say is that you can try to understand, it's a cheap word, but try to appreciate that, you know, the sorrow of the mother can't be judged on human standards. You have to feel it on human standards. How does it feel? It feels like sorrow. It feels like grief. I know I'm drenched with it and I have been all my life. It marks me. Marks my face. But still I know that I'm a human animal translating it into a human scale emotion that has a certain value on it. But for her... It's just intensity. It's part of her addiction. And the first instruction of Kala Tantra applies to her. The aeon. In the same way it applies to a human animal. The addiction becomes mastery. That is an extremely subtle teaching. Be not mistaken. It does not mean that you master your addiction. If it is truly your core addiction, then you cannot master it in the sense of control it or let go of it. The very intensity of the addiction creates in you the skill to master your entire life. And likewise, the intensity of the sorrow of the mother creates that skill in her. These are transcendent truths to understand transcendently and to hold them 
So I advise you to hold them in the human scale of your mind and emotions, knowing that the matters of which I speak transcend humanity.